I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. It's all about the science behind food. Science and You starts now. I'm Andrew Falzone. This room may look like a science lab, but it's actually a prep room in one of New York City's finest culinary schools. Today we'll be transforming cooking from an art into a science. That story's ahead on Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. Toasty, fruity, nutty, chocolatey. Are they flavors or odors? How our sense of smell affects what we eat? The connection coming up on Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. The ocean and its seaweed is fascinating to scientists and now an artist and author. We'll tell you why coming up on Science and You. I'm Carol Ann Riddell, the science of mixology. Come join us for a cocktail ahead on Science and You. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz, beer ahead on Science and You. I'm Andrew Falzone. For the past 30 years, the International Culinary Center has been turning cooking enthusiasts into culinary professionals. While you may think of cooking as a fine art, today we're going to learn some recipes that turn cooking into a science. Creating a plate that looks like a masterpiece can take quite a bit of culinary experience, and Chef Hervé Malaver has just that. Chef Hervé has been in the food business since the age of 12, helping his father deliver cheese to restaurants in his homeland of France. Today he's the Director of Culinary Technology at the International Culinary Center in Soho, where his primary goal is to make great tasting food with all natural ingredients. Our first recipe infused some science into a classic appetizer. Chef Hervé guided us through the preparation of his beet and goat cheese salad. He did this by using a group of powdered ingredients called hydrocolloids, which can have a profound effect on the texture of liquids when used correctly. They are gels, they are gum, they used to do uh uh, to do a thickener, to get something a little thicker work for a sauce, you can do an emulsion. Okay. You can do, that's what we're going to do, some emulsion today. Okay. Uh, and like this, you can replace some different ingredients you don't want to use. Chef Hervé started out with fresh beet juice and two hydrocolloids, methyl cellulose and xanthan gum. All three were mixed together on a very slow speed in a professional blender. So here, then when I'm going to use the blender, I'll be able to trap the air inside. You see already the color changing slightly. Sure, some of the air, a yes, bit. Yeah. some of the air is going to be trapped. Our thickened beet juice was then whisked in a stand mixer and turned into a beet foam. It was spooned into a pastry bag and piped onto a tray. Three hours in a dehydrator removed the moisture from the foam, leaving us with perfectly formed beet puffs. Agar agar and locust bean gum are hydrocolloids. Chef Hervé whisked them into some boiling beet juice. Using a food grade syringe, he drew the liquid out of the pan and cooled it in ice water, forming a beet gel that was shaped like spaghetti. But now, if you didn't see it, and I will bring you this, you'll be like, oh, my, how, how did it do that? Exactly. It's like a magic trick. You know? And with surgical precision, Chef Hervé wrapped the beet gel around a roasted beet spear. It was added to a plate with some goat cheese wedges and shavings, pickled golden beets and microgreens to create a masterpiece of an appetizer. The next course was an entree that wasn't quite as technical as the appetizer, but required some more complicated tools. We're going to do a pastrami, okay. very simple pastrami. The only difference, uh, I didn't use brisket. I use short ribs. I use a boneless short ribs. Uh, reason is my personal uh, preference is just more meaty, less okay. fatty. Sure. It took Chef Hervé 10 days to prepare the pastrami short rib using a cooking technique known as sous vide. This technique slow cooks food at low temperature after it's been sealed in a vacuum bag. This digital device makes sous vide possible. It's called an immersion circulator and keeps the water flowing evenly in the large plastic tub while controlling temperature to a tenth of a degree. What it does by doing this sous vide, it keeps same thing again, all the flavor, but your meat will never overcooked. It will be nice, tender, etc., etc. 
This large vacuum chamber is the size of a small kitchen table. While both size and cost would prevent the home cook from keeping this on their countertop, it didn't keep Chef Hervé from using it to instantly pickle these delicate mushroom florets. Pickling can normally take weeks, but in the vacuum chamber, it's almost instantaneous. Machine is on, just close the lid. So what's happening here? I'm, removing, I'm going to remove all the air, all the oxygen from inside the chamber. Okay. And the mushroom is going to be infused. When the air is coming back, the pressure is coming back on top, it's going to infuse the mushroom. To complete the dish, Chef Hervé prepared a smoked celery root puree. In order to smoke the celery root, we used a tool called a smoking gun. Using the wood of your choice, it infuses the smoke flavor into your food. In this case, Chef Hervé used a custom-cut blender top to infuse the smoke while pureeing the celery root, which had already been cooked sous vide, along with cream, butter, and cayenne pepper. The resulting two dishes would be the envy of any dinner party or any science lab. So the next time you prepare a meal, maybe you can work some science into the menu. I'm Andrew Falzone for Science and You. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. What would food taste like if we couldn't smell it? The correlation between taste and smell and maintaining a healthy diet. The correlation between taste and smell is something we take for granted every single day. It's hard to separate the two. Our perception of odors around us, things like flowers, you know, stop and smell the roses. What do you do? You smell, and uh, it's a very special sense. Dr. Anil Lalwani is an otolaryngologist. That's an ear, nose, and throat specialist to us. He heads up the department at Columbia Doctors, the Midtown facility of Columbia University Medical Center. How are tastes and odors linked? Our smell gives us the, 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 the flavor of something that we would taste. So our taste buds are on our tongue. We taste something, but the flavor that we get from it, beyond the sweet and the salty and the bitter and the sour, really has to be, is complemented by our sense of smell and our, whether we find it flavorful or not flavorful. So without smell, we don't really taste completely. How does the sense of smell affect how we eat, basically from walking into that bakery and smelling those cookies and being tempted or smelling those french fries from a particular fast food place that we all know. Um, explain that a little. You walk into a bakery and you smell that wonderfully freshly uh, baked bread, you're more likely to want to buy that bread. So sense of smell doesn't occur in isolation. It occurs in the setting There's of your entire brain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So our sense of taste and smell are not just relegated to here and here. I mean, it's, it's also up here, right? Absolutely. And ultimately, how we perceive the taste is affected by our mood as well. So if you're in a bad mood, the same smells that may have turned you on, whether it was that last glass of wine, would maybe turn you off. In Dr. Lalwani's opinion, there is a quintessential beverage that engages and energizes our senses while making a meal that much more enjoyable. The best example is, is a wonderful glass of red wine. Before you even taste the wine, you smell the wine. Right and the bouquet of the wine. And there's so many different words to describe what that smell is all about. And so you have some perception about the wine before you've even put it on your taste buds. Speaking of taste buds, serious foodies will tell you that of all the flavorful condiments, ketchup touches on everything and zaps those taste buds like nothing else. It, it really does. And actually many condiments really do. Like whether it's mustard, whether it's ketchup, because it appeals to many of the salt, you know, the sour, the bitter, and the sweet. They often have combination of those tastes, and they're very strong, very flavorful. But when I'm eating French fries with ketchup, I think I end up eating more ketchup than I do the French fries. <laughs> so whether you pick up that glass of wine or smother those French fries in ketchup, remember, your senses will be grateful. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson for Science and You. For most of our recent history, we didn't need labels to describe the food we grew on our farms. It was only with the rise of industrial farming and the pesticides, fertilizers, and other chemicals that go along with it that we even needed words to differentiate how our food was grown. So the term, or food label, organic, is a relatively new concept. What exactly does organic mean when it comes to foods? 
Organic is a labeling term, and what it indicates is that the farmers and manufacturers of these foods are following USDA's regulations. The organic farmers have to use special methods, and they cannot use irradiation, sewage sludge, they cannot use anything GMO, genetically modified organisms, and they cannot use synthetic fertilizers and herbicides. So the organic chickens and beef have to be uh, free of antibiotics and hormones. Now, is organic the same or similar to natural? We see that on some food labels as well. Organic and natural are different. You know, when a product is organic, you would see the seal from the USDA that tells you it's organic. Natural pertains to regulations when you are having foods prepared with beef, chicken, or eggs. And these have to be minimally processed and not um, use any artificial ingredients. And that's why they can be called natural. But, but not it, organic. But they are not organic. So if organic foods are supposed to be grown a certain way, who enforces those standards to ensure those labels really are true? The National Organic Program has been set up by the USDA and they have very good regulations. And if the product is labeled organic, you actually have to put the name of the certifying agent on the label. So it's very strict rules and there's continuous monitoring you can actually trust the seal if it's there. Okay, so there are strict standards for how organic foods are grown, raised, and processed, but does that mean they're more nutritious superfoods? I think people assume that organic is more nutritious, but is that really the case? There's a lot of research being done because there's a lot of interest in that, and so far they've found that conventional foods and organic foods nutritionally are compatible. They're about the same They're about the same. They're about the same. So if conventionally raised foods and organic foods are roughly equivalent nutritionally, why pay that premium for organics? It's partly what they don't have. In organic foods, there's an added dimension. They are free of synthetic herbicides, pesticides, um, insecticides. Healthier food raised sustainably and supporting our local economy. Sounds like a better way to eat all around. For CUNY TV, I'm Dr. Max Gomez. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. When you're out for a drink with friends, an icy cocktail can feel like a work of art. But you might not realize there's a lot of science in the glass as well. The ethanol vapor is traveling up this distillation column and passing into this water jacket as a vapor. Meet Anthony Caparelli, part master bartender, part wonky scientist, a mixologist who is passionate about what's in your cocktail and how it got there. I started out as an engineer and then I became a bartender. So what I try and do is, is take a lot of the myths and common practices and actually test them in a laboratory setting and see what actually results in either a better drink, faster service, um, a better experience for the guests, more money for the bartender, whatever it is. Anthony gave us a private mixology lesson at the Gilroy, a bar on Manhattan's Upper East Side. For him, bartending is both art and science. When you step behind the bar, it is the perfect merger of those two passions. It is science that is performed. And I always tell people when I step behind the bar, I feel like I'm doing a Broadway play. So do you really geek out about bartending? Yeah, I really geek out about bartending. I really do. For most of us, beer is beer, not for Anthony. It's the beginning of the spirit distillation process. The yeast will start ingesting the sugar, converting it to ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide. And if you think about it, that's what beer is. And when you're able to extract and concentrate ethyl alcohol, right there you have the basis for making spirits, which brings us to whiskey. What I started with was white moonshine, exactly what we're distilling here. Okay. No color at all. And this has been running for maybe 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You watched me set this mm -hmm. up, right? And all I'm doing is I put some oak chips in there with the, with the moonshine, and I'm just stirring it to agitate it a little. And you can see we already have some beautiful color yep. on that. It's already starting to look like whiskey. It is. And if you go ahead and smell that. It definitely smells like whiskey. Understanding some of the science and, as it turns out, the math of cocktails can make for a better drink. Take it from the president of New York City's Bartenders Guild, Pam Wisnitzer. We measure everything out so precise because a quarter of an ounce too much in your drink and the whole thing can be real. So there's a lot of math in this too. A lot of math. Math in the science of taste. Mm -hmm. 
One of Pam's suggestions, when enjoying a cocktail, use all your senses. The aromatics of lemon peel are not to be missed. When you're actually tasting, you're using retronasal smell to taste most of your cocktail, and that happens with the nose. So the first thing you should be doing in any cocktail, engaging in anything that you do, is smelling it. And when it comes to herbs like the mint in your mojito, be gentle. You don't actually want to muddle the herbs uh, that are going to be in your glass. And the reason being is that if you over muddle or over stimulate the herb, it's going to turn bitter. I like to wake it up with just like a little slap, or I lightly smack it here, mm -hmm. and then if you can, you can always I can start already smell, smell it. Pam explains much of what makes a cocktail taste good is understanding how flavors work together. I just built a cocktail recently um, where I used rose liqueur, apple, and strawberry because they all come from the same genus. They all come from the same family, so they're all intrinsically connected. How'd it turn out? I mean, it was great. I won a competition with it. Awesome! <laughs> the final exam in Mixology 101, the taste test. I tried what's called the sidecar, and it passed with flying colors. Wow. Yeah. That is delicious. Yeah. Science and art all in one frosty, delicious cocktail. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Science and You. Cheers. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Beer is an ancient beverage. It's been around since the Egyptians. Beer and wine have contributed significantly to science, and in return, science has made brewing beer fun and easy. Brooklyn's own John LaPola of Bitter and Esters shows us how it's done. Today we're making a rye IPA Great. called Into the Cosmos <laughs> uh, because it uses galaxy hops. This number here, this degree L, stands for degrees love bond and the higher that number, the darker the grain, and the darker the grain, the darker the beer is going to be. The first step in brewing beer is milling the grain to very specific proportions. You want to be able to get as much flour or, or actual starch that's inside uh, exposed from the grain, but you also want to leave the hull as intact as possible so that there, it's porous, so that water can actually run through it. And where does the science come into beer? mainly with enzymatic conversion of the starches to sugar. Uh, enzymes are a type of protein that actually acts as a catalyst for um, any sort of uh, chemical reaction, depending on the temperature of the mash. And so that's one really nerdy sciencey thing that you can get into. In this case, we're going to be activating both beta and alpha amylase enzymes, and they are both um, what we call sacrification enzymes. It turns out math is also very important in beer. A small miscalculation in water temperature changes the enzymatic starch conversions. A few degrees too hot, and your wort will be too sweet with less alcohol. This heating and cooling stage is also crucial in the history of beer, because back in the day, before we knew about microbes, beer was often cleaner and safer than water. In modern times, proper heating and cooling is important to bringing out particular flavors. A good portion of the flavor comes from the hops. Uh, the bitterness and the aromatic. All you need to do is pour those hops right into the boiling pot. This is called our bittering addition of hops. It's really nice. I'm sad to let it go. All right, the next hop addition will be in 15 minutes. With all our ingredients in the pot, we cover our fermenter with a well sanitized airlock and wait. I'll see you in two weeks for a taste. While our enzymes and microbes transform sugar into alcohol, I went to visit Professor Bert Hansen, Baruch College Professor of Medical History, to find out more about the scientific importance of beer. What does beer have to do with Louis Pasteur? Uh, Pasteur's great achievement in fermentation, beer making, wine making, was saying that microbes are necessary to making the transformation, and the wrong kind of microbes will ruin it. And sorting that out, and which are which, uh, is the great discovery, and it leads out of fermentation into the germ theory disease as well. You can't ask more than that for one man. People were moderately successful in making wine and beer, but before Pasteur, you couldn't be confident that it would, you could keep it very long. The pasteurization technique at the end stage totally changed the possibility of marketing, selling over great distances and longer times. So, in a roundabout way, beer saved humanity. Pasteur was interested in saving the beer industry and the wine industry for France, and in the process of his work, he invents the germ theory and saves hundreds of thousands of lives. And changed our world. And changed our world, fundamentally. Go beer. Yep. Our scientifically brewed batch of beer sat in a cool, dark place for three weeks. Now, it's time to taste it. So, this is the fruit of your labor. <laughs> Well done. 
from Bitter and Esters in Brooklyn. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Science and You. I'm Donna Hanover. We think of plants and trees as providing lots of the oxygen on our planet, but actually seaweed generates about 20% of the oxygen we need. That's just one of its beauties, according to artist Josie Islin, the author of An Ocean Garden. I happened to take a scrap of seaweed and hold it up to the sky, and that was really this, this aha moment for me because I was struck with this magnificence of form and this really this intense magenta color. As a visual artist and a designer, I really uh, want to use this kind of wow factor of how, how fantastically beautiful seaweed is to bring people into the science of seaweed. Most people don't think of seaweed as being beautiful. They think of it as getting tangled in their feet and being kind of brown and yucky. Well, one of the, um, the things about seaweed is we don't see it in its, in its most natural state. We see it at low tide uh, when it's uh, hanging very unceremoniously over the rocks. Um, it kind of drapes there. It's goopy. Uh, but when the tide comes in, it uses the buoyancy of the, of the ocean water. Seaweeds are magnificent photosynthesizers. They um, use a range of pigments to gather sunlight, splitting water molecules uh, and combining it with carbon dioxide and coming up with organic growth and oxygen. Oxygen. And oxygen is what, what makes our planet go. Josie uses a scanner rather than a camera to record images of seaweed. As a photographer, daylight, incandescent light, fluorescent light, all creates different, uh, a different color um, situation for your camera, whereas the scanner allows me to capture very true color. The greens um, have uh, just chlorophyll in their cells as their light grabbing uh, pigment. And the browns have an accessory pigment. That brown pigment combines with the green and makes this array of olive colors, golden yellows, uh, and, and deep brown. Mm -hmm. And then there's the reds that have just one chlorophyll A, but they also have a blue and a red accessory pigment. Josie grew up on the coast of Maine, lives now on the coast of Northern California, and has authored several books about ocean stones and nearshore life. For an ocean garden, she scanned some seaweed specimens that had been stored by scientists in herbariums. She dried some of her own, and then there were the wet ones. This was a very large specimen that kind of draped over the sides of the scanner, but I had to capture it wet because the bull kelp, when it dries, it dries into this dark, very uninteresting, thing, whereas when it's alive and wet, it's just spectacular. Josie says Americans seem to be eating more seaweed, having learned from other cultures its health value, but we've long used seaweed derivatives. Uh, something called carrageenan uh, has been derived from Irish moss, a very, very common seaweed here on the eastern seaboard. Um, and it's the, that carrageenan that is used by chemical engineers to make uh, ice cream smooth in our mouth and to keep cottage cheese bound together and toothpaste uh, not fall off our, our toothbrush. Seaweeds are beautifully adapted to the chaos of losing their environment twice a day when the tide goes out. It's the phycocolloids in its cell walls. That's what keeps it moist uh, when the tide is out. And the seaweeds actually provide a haven. They hold the ocean there for a lot of uh, marine invertebrates that need to keep damp or away from, from the drying sun when the tide is out. Every cell of a seaweed gets its nutrients directly from the water, so seaweeds don't have roots like plants do. But seaweeds have a holdfast that anchors them to rocks or the ocean floor so they don't float away. Sometimes it's just a bit of sticky substance, and sometimes it grows quite large. The holdfast can be this um, rather elaborate uh, branching of haptera, which have kind of a magical glue that um, hold it to the floor. This is a dried holdfast, uh, and these um, would be, in, their, in, in life, uh, would be holding on to the bottom. Uh, but they've been worn away and make this fabulously sculptural element. And I have to say that as a visual artist, this is what I'm attracted to for. I want people to fall in love. I want them to fall in love with something they've never really considered before. What is it that makes seaweed beautiful in your eyes? The variety of form, the strength of form, um, and, and the color. It's stupendous. How can you beat it? 
seaweed is a great subject for both science and art. I'm Donna Hanover for Science and You. That's our show for today. I'm Magalie Laguerre-Wilkinson. See you next time on Science and You.